Welcome to Sky Team's People First with Morag Barrett. So my friend and colleague, Dr. Terry Jackson, is a dynamic executive advisor, thought leader, TEDx speaker, and organizational consultant. He's a member of the prestigious Marshall Goldsmith 100 Coaches Group, which is how I've come to know him, and was recently chosen by Thinkers 50 as one of the top 50 leaders in executive coaching. Terry has also been named by Thinkers 360 as one of the top 20 global leaders in the future of work, and by CIO Review Magazine, who have named him and his, his consulting company, JCG Consulting Group, as one of the top 10 most promising leadership development solution providers in 2019. So Terry, welcome to People First. Well, thank you so very much, Morag. It's a pleasure to be here with you. I'm honored. Oh, I am so excited for our conversation and to get into the nitty gritty of the value you bring to your clients and organizations. But as with all my episodes, I want to start with your origin story. When you <laughs> were a small boy back in elementary school and the teacher saying, what do you want to be when you grow up? What did you think you would be doing? What did you picture at that time? Mm, that's an excellent question. Um, because I, early on, I realized, even though I was a lover of sports and I played sports all through high school, college, um, as a lover of sports, I always realized at a young boy that it wasn't really about being a professional sports athlete for me. It was really about owning a business, owning a sports type of business. Okay. And with that, I remember um, a local newspaper did a story on me in the ninth grade, ninth grade actually, asking me what I wanted to do. I said, well, I was going to attend college, and my goal at the time was to open a sporting goods store. So business mm -hmm. has always been a part of my uh, mindset, my process, even though for my family, there were no real entrepreneurs in the family. But for whatever reason, you know, I love sports and I just saw the next step as being owning a sporting goods store that will allow me to uh, provide equipment and services for sporting, for sporting teams. Well, that's interesting. So there was a pivot point where you went from selling sporting gear then to selling your expertise and skills. <laughs> you are now the product, Mr. Jackson. So what was the pivot point then that brought you from selling things to selling tools, concepts, your ideas? I remember in an interview process uh, while I was in college, someone asked me the question, what is the most difficult thing to sell? And I sat there and I pondered and I pondered and I pondered. And I couldn't answer. At the end of the interview process, the gentleman said, the most difficult thing to sell is you. I began to think about that at that particular time. And I began to realize that everything that we do in life is a sale. Whether uh, I meet you for the first time and mm -hmm. I'm selling myself on you, you're selling yourself to me. The great thing about sales is you're trying to get into the head of the person or the other people or the consumer that you're trying to convince uh, to purchase or use your goods, or your services. So there's a lot of psychology to that. You know, what is that compelling message that's going to pull on the heartstrings of those people or, or, or that individual that is going to enable you to actually um, convince them that your product or service or you are the right person for the job. It's interesting you say that because I certainly know when I first started my own business and Sky Team, we've been in business 13 years now, um, notwithstanding that I came from the banking industry where I did have to sell credit cards, etc. My biggest mind block when I started was getting out of my own head mm -hmm. and the, oh, I don't like sales and I don't want to be seen as a sleazy salesperson and trying to disconnect the two and for me the mind game I played with myself is it's not sales it's a conversation mm. use me or don't use me there are plenty of coaches and leadership consultants in the world either way I've made a new connection and that's how I did it it was just I'm here for the conversation and I took for myself the sales aspect out of it 
Mm. So how did you make that adjustment then to pitching yourself to become such a successful and, as I said, sought out executive coach and organizational consultant? That's interesting because as I kind of looked around in, in corporate America when I was an undergraduate, of course, my undergrad degree is in business. I looked around at all of the business gurus of the time uh, who were considered to be the expert in their field. And I listened to their narratives, their stories. I looked at their approach and their process as to how they got their message out and understood that it was about a system. And so as I began to move away from uh, necessary, or, or, or as I began to put my message out there, for me, it was always about building a business, not necessarily building my personal brand, even though I know that is the word of the day. That is the phrase, build your personal brand. Now I kind of see how they overlap the personal brand along with the business. You know, when I thought about businesses, I thought about companies like IBM at the time. You know, nobody was calling on the CEO of IBM to do business with IBM. They were going to IBM to do business because they needed computers at the time, right? Mm -hmm. So it wasn't about the individual, it was more about the brand bigger brand of the company, the business. And so that's how I always see, saw things. And for until I began to realize there was more of the personal brand, I wanted to name my, my company something outside of my name because I wanted to build a business. So people can call on the business, not necessarily having to carry Jackson to do that business. As we begin to shift from business to the personal brand in order to build the business, I began to realize that I had to create a narrative around being able to have a conversation around solutions for executives and for businesses. And so that's what I began to do. And so I, I pivoted uh, because in my last corporate position, I actually ran a vision of a marketing firm. Mm -hmm. And Running that, I was also a student, meaning that I was learning as we worked with other Fortune 500 companies and helping them developing their marketing campaigns. It hit me that I must develop not only my personal brand, but a business brand, and be able to articulate that in such a conversation that people would be willing to go more in depth with me around what their challenges are that they're facing. So I love that, that your work encompasses the full spectrum from individuals through to organizations. Yes. And I know you have a very powerful TEDx talk where you talk about the difference between change versus transformation. Yes. So let's just start there. How do you differentiate between the two? Are they not synonymous? Oh, they are not synonymous. Change is past based. Transformation begins right now. And transformation is a journey that doesn't have an end. Change can begin and end. I like to use the analogy of the butterfly, right? But the, the caterpillar to the butterfly. You know, the mm -hmm. caterpillar comes in the world as a caterpillar, and then it, you know, it begins to go through its metamorphosis. And that metamorphosis is a transformation into becoming a butterfly. See, the butterfly is not a better caterpillar. It's a whole different being. Mm -hmm. And transformation is becoming is about becoming a different being. It's really about challenging all of the old assumptions, but understanding who you want to be, not necessarily based on who you were. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's interesting that you use that metaphor because the other thing that many of us aren't aware of, to your point, the caterpillar and the butterfly are two different insects. Yes. animals, concepts. Um, and the the caterpillar actually goes through a very messy middle where it kind of decomposes, yes. you know, mm -hmm. and then becomes the butterfly. And I think that's what I like about your differentiation is that change, if you read the textbooks on change, it would imply that it's a nice linear step-by-step -step process. You start, there's a middle and ta-da, there's an end. Whereas transformation, if, especially with the cap caterpillar analogy, it embraces the messy middle, the yucky bit where it's sticky and not quite sure it's going to yes. move through. And again, the research shows, Terry, that change efforts, transformation efforts 
are not as successful as we would like. What do you attribute that to? You know, that's interesting because <laughs> I'm working on a transformational project right now with a client. And one of the things that I've shared with them and from one of our colleagues, actually, um, Charlene Lee, about transformation, the disruption mindset, right, is this. I shared with them some success stories of companies who actually went through transformation very successfully. And we both know the statistics around 70% of all transformation initiatives or change initiatives fail. I study the 30% that succeed. I need to know, I need to know the 30% that succeeded. It's, it's so easy to do because if 70% fail, I need to understand what the foundation was for those that succeeded and study mm -hmm. those companies which increases the probability of the success of a transformational agent. And another difference is, and we kind of touched on this earlier, oftentimes clients think that doing transformation, you're supposed to do the work for them. You're going to transform them. When in fact, the transformation is incumbent upon them. They are do the work to transform because it begins in the mind that I'm capable of doing such. Now I start to take action opposite or different from what I'm accustomed to doing. And I become accustomed to being uncomfortable. I become comfortable being uncomfortable because as you mentioned, with the caterpillar going to the, the cocoon, the messy middle, right? There's chaos, right? There's fear. Right, there's ambiguity, there's uncertainty. And so you have to be able to embrace that and continue to move through the fear. You have to be courageous. If you're not courageous during transformation, the likelihood of it succeeding is slim. So I love that. You're a great, great consultant, but even as a great consultant, to your point, you can't affect that change unless the organization and the people who are part of it choose to step up. So you're saying transformational thinking is what leads to the transformational doing. Absolutely. So what are the steps to getting to people to think differently? Mm, you know, I use some very simple exercises. You know, I remember asking my client, did you change your route to work today? Or did you use the same route? Did you pick up a different book today to read? Did you wake up at a different time to take your shower? Did you take your route to the bank? I mean, did you make that route differently? Did you address your spouse differently this morning? Because we know as human beings, we're creatures of habit. Mm -hmm. And so what we need also are small wins, which give us the momentum to continue along the path that's uncomfortable for us. Small wins make the uncomfortable a little bit more comfortable. And so as we begin to take those habits, those, those habits and begin to change them about how they go to work, what time they wake up. Those are small wins and truly that's not transformation, that's change and that's incremental. We know that transformation is actually um, explosive. It's something that happens, it, it happens quickly, right? But you have to get the small wins in first. So change is a part of transformation Transformation is not necessarily a part of change, right? So it sounds, though, if you're going down this new path, and to your point, moving us out of our comfort zone, there's an element of fear that goes with it, because how do I know if this is the right path? Well, you don't know that it's the right path. <laughs> okay. Um, you have done a little bit, of, you, you have determined who you want to become either as an individual or an organization. And in determining that, you begin to make steps toward that. For instance, uh, I remember reading a, a case a study on um, T-Mobile. Mm -hmm. T-Mobile decided back in, I, don't, I guess it was 2011, that they were going to go through a transformation. And in doing so, the CEO said, we have to be successful. So the first thing he did, if you take a look at pictures of, his name is John Legere. 
if you take a look at pictures of him, you see him in his corporate suit, tie, very clean cut. But in order to make the transformation, he himself became the role model for transformation. So he went from the clean cut CEO to the hippie looking CEO, wearing warm ups, letting his hair grow long, letting his facial hair grow. Because they decided to become the uncarrier, meaning they were the company that actually eliminated contracts for cell phone service. But he became the role model by changing his total look, appearance. It was easy for his, and I don't, I'm not saying every CEO has to do that, but it was easy for his company to begin to follow him. And I can tell you that between 2011 and 2018, T-Mobile, as a result of their transformation, more than doubled their revenue. They went from roughly 20 million, uh, 20 billion a year in revenue to more than 40 billion a year. Uh, revenue in a seven year period of time. So that transformation for them stuck because they lived it, right? It's something that mm. you have to live on a day to day basis. It's not something you just give lip service to. Yeah, often I find leaders get stuck in the quagmire of what's not working. And they have a logical goal of let's increase revenue, let's launch a new product, whatever it might be. But that in itself causes a disconnect that reinforces the stuckness. And what I like about the story you just shared about T-Mobile is that it, there was the physical role model. There was signs and symbols that this was different and not just yet another talking head of, oh, if we outweigh it, we'll go back to the old ways, that something new was afoot. So yes. how does one how does a leader listening to this start to think about closing that gap between their vision of what needs to happen and selling it in a way that engages not just the minds but the hearts and minds mm. of the people impacted so that we can ultimately tap into the hands to make it happen how do you get that passion and excitement other than growing out facial hair which is going to be a challenge for me <laughs> you know um I'm a little different about passion because passion is an emotion that's fleeting. Mm -hmm. One day you can be very passionate and the next day you can, you know, because of it's, an, it's emotional, you can be very low. For me, it's about the why. It's about the purpose, right? It's the purpose that connects people. It's mm -hmm. the bigger picture, right? Then once you find what that why is, that to that purpose, then you begin to add the passion in once you discover purpose. So the purpose keeps mm -hmm. you going when you're up or you're down because you understand what the purpose is. So you don't have to necessarily rely on those emotions taking you on that emotional roller coaster. You understand why the existence of this. And so with any organization or individual that's going through transformation, the first thing I said to them is we have to clearly understand and be able to articulate the why, the purpose for the transformation. Once you get the purpose for the transformation, you can talk to the people about the impact that it's going to have on them, the opportunities, you know, the opportunity to use your curiosity and your imagination to uh, be able to create the narrative in such a way that it pulls at the heartstrings, right? It pulls at the heart of the people. But purpose is about heart. Purpose I love is, that. Yes, purpose is about heart and mind. And it's interesting. And of course, 2020 has been the ultimate emotional roller coaster ride. So, to your point, the passion and then the despair, or whatever words one wants to use about the, the polarity that we have all experienced. I know I've experienced sometimes all on the same day, um, yes. has been interesting. But if that why and that purpose can be the guiding light through all of it, it reduces hopefully the volatility of either end of that spectrum. Yes, one question we always have to remember during all of that volatility is we must always remember why we, why we are here. That's the question, why are we here? 
that's the key to the purpose and getting people back to center around the purpose and, and, and kind of not eliminating, but minimizing the emotion because it's going to be the purpose that's going to drive long term because transformation, as I said earlier, is a journey. It's mm-hmm. long term. It's not short term. And actually, it doesn't have an end. It's continual, it's perpetual. And so uh, once you start that journey, uh, you're always on it. I just heard a story last week about when Stanford University Hospital decided to go through the transformation. Well, they're 20 years into their transformational effort. <laughs> and, and, and they're continuing to excel. But they're challenging all assumptions every day in order to perform better for, for their, their clientele. So I'm curious about you personally then. What's your own transformational journey? How has your leadership philosophy evolved over time? Mm, that's an excellent question. You know, you, you asked me a little bit, I think, or you mentioned my book maybe earlier. Um, and I'll tell you that at that point when I began writing, which was roughly around 2004, that was the beginning of me for transformation. I, I I was in a business at one time and I looked in the mirror one morning and I said, I don't like what I see. I don't like who I see. I mm-hmm. began the process of transformation. I began to reach out for a lot of resources to read. I began to speak to a lot of people who I actually uh, considered mentors to have conversations with. Uh, Knowing that I wanted to get into a space of consulting and coaching, I began to do my research uh, on this particular space, uh, not knowing where I was going to end up or not even knowing the type of coach I was going to become. But my evolution started as a business coach with small businesses uh, locally. And I actually took a break and went back into corporate America as I started that. And I said to myself, if I can utilize these skills that I've learned from coaching um, inside a corporate setting to help develop people, then I can use it anywhere. So I took a hiatus, went back, ran a division of a firm for five years, tested what I learned, never missed a number with, with an operations or a sales team. And then uh, I decided it's, it's that time. So my transformation began by saying, OK, there has to be a, a different type of theory. There has to be a different uh, uh, way of thinking. Mind you, that even though the transformation was taking place, I still wanted to be in the arena of business, of commerce, of leading and developing people. So I created for myself a seven word kind of mission statement. And that is helping others improve their quality of life. For me, it's all encompassing. It's all encompassing because whether you're an employee, of mine, whether you're a friend, I'm just meeting you. In my conversation, I hope to give you a nugget that's going to improve the quality of your life. I help to get, whether that's an idea or something you can take action on. It's really about improving the quality of life of others. And so that's why seven words, uh, which I've been told seven words is the, uh, is, is, is significant uh, for completion. And so I did it in seven words. Wow. And uh, that's a theme I've heard from everybody who has known you longer than I, your approachability, your generosity, your deep thought, but that mm-hmm. outward focus on others. And as you mentioned your book, it's transformational thinking, the first step towards individual and organizational greatness. And so if I'm picking up that book, what am I going to be taking away from it that's going to help me or my organization move forward? The first thing is, one, it's a call to arms. Mm-hmm. It's a call to arms for individuals to look at themselves and for the organizations to look at themselves collectively and figure out how can we be different. And that call to arms challenges you to challenge all assumptions. You know, I, I think you've, you've probably heard this day one every day. Right. Mm-hmm. Every day you walk in, it should be fresh. You should be looking for a new uh, solution to a, 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 to a problem or creating something that solves a future problem. Right. 
And so with, with, with that, your ability to challenge those assumptions on a day-to-day -day basis, what we have to be able to do, and I've created this model around the 11 P's of transformation. Okay. First P is perception. We got to challenge how we see the world, how we see ourselves, how we see others. Second is potential. What is our true potential? What is the potential of others? What is the potential of the organizations? So we have to challenge those assumptions around potential. We have to challenge the, our potential, uh, excuse me, we have to challenge our assumptions around our principles. Hmm. There's no sacred cow, right? We're going to ch challenge every aspect of our life. We're going to overturn every rock of our life. We have to challenge our passion, our assumptions around passion. As I mentioned to you earlier, mm -hmm. I passion a little bit differently than, than others. You know, that's the fuel, but I need to have the purpose. So we need to also challenge all assumptions around politics, not necessarily Republican and Democrat, but the politics of the organization and how we align ourselves and how we show up every day as an organization for the consumer. We challenge all of our assumptions around our people they can what they can do what do they need to be able to excel as 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 people within this system that we know as as, a, as an organization and we have to challenge the assumptions around what our purpose is is it really are we in the right business you know and 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 you know what do we really give back to our consumer or to, or to society we have to challenge assumptions around our plan you know, we our plans as an organization uh, for not only, you know, growth, but our plans uh, around how we uh, serve the community, right? Uh, we have to challenge all assumptions around our processes all the time, right? How can we become better? You know, how can we take something that already exists, create something that's never existed before? Mm -hmm. How do we see it differently? Um, we challenge assumptions around perseverance. And right now, COVID-19 has all of us charged challenging our assumptions around how well we persevere. Mm -hmm. And lastly, we have to challenge our assumption, assumptions around pliability. How flexible you know, are we? How agile are we? How adaptable you know, are we? Um, because I think we can get more out of ourselves if we challenge all of these, what I call the, the 11 Ps of transformation. I love that 11 P's. And I was thinking about you touched on it there with COVID. I think it's the ultimate cocktail shaker that's taken all of those P's and given them a good shake. When you think about the experience, because it's it has been an overnight transformation where we've gone from one reality perception to a an adapted one. Um, we've certainly challenged processes and people and the how we organize and how we relate or don't relate. Um, if you just look at the headlines, et cetera. What do you hope that we as a human race, let's make it as broad as possible here. What do you hope that we actually take away from this experience? That's an excellent question. And you used a word that I've been using in this whole COVID-19 environment, and that is human. We are all human. We've seen a great deal of events happen during COVID, from people getting sick, mm -hmm. to unrest, a, a social unrest, uh, to corporations uh, shutting their doors, and, and been impacted. And I think we have to understand and realize that we are all the same. We're no different. Mm -hmm. We have the same wants and needs as everyone else. I don't care if I'm in the United States of America, if I'm in Denmark, and if I'm in Africa. I'm human. So all of the labels that have been created around the dehumanization of people, all of the activities around the objectification of people, when we really get down to it, COVID has really exposed the fact that we are all vulnerable, we are all human and we all need each other in order to survive. That's what I want people to take away from COVID-19, whether you're an organization, mm -hmm. a group, because I don't care what technology is, 
it still takes the human being and the human mind to create what that technology looks like for the future. Right? So you still have to have the human being. The human being is the most important part of the commerce equation because it's through the imagination and the curiosity of the human being that we create products and services for everyone else to benefit from. Terry, those are powerful words. Thank you so much for sharing. Mm -hmm. As we come towards the end of our time together, what final thoughts do you have for people who are listening who are likely in the midst of their own change and or transformation? You know, that's an, I, I, I really love that because I'm going to actually go back to a passage in the book around transformation and this passage goes something like, uh, it, let me, it goes something like this. Is it time we all begin to assume the responsibility for improving our own lives and the world in which we live? Is it time to recognize our difference as a source of increased perception rather than barriers? Is it time we all get off our individual and collective butts and begin contributing and constructing rather than denouncing and destroying? Is it time to come together in a spirit of true communication, cooperation, and coordination? Is it time to build up our strengths and develop our weaknesses? Is it time we recognize and celebrate the human spirit and tap into this incredible source of unlimited potential redirecting our energy? time and efforts towards more constructive and meaningful purposes. Isn't it time for a little transformational thinking? I'm going to go and vote heck yes. <laughs> Thank you, Terry. I truly appreciate in this short time, you just giving me a glance, giving the listeners a glance to the depth of your experience and impact. Um, to the extent we've uh, piqued others' curiosity, how can they get a hold of you, find more about the book and the consulting work that you and your team do? Awesome, awesome. Okay. Dee, thank you so much for this. Um, the book can be found at Amazon, amazon.com. It is Transformational Thinking, the first step toward individual and organizational greatness. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn as I like to play on social media from time to time. You'll find me on LinkedIn, uh, Terrence Jackson, PhD. Uh, you can find me on Facebook. You can find me on Twitter. Um, so, And you can find me on YouTube with a couple pieces that I've done. So, um, Email address, uh, uh, terry at jcgconsultinggroup.com. So thank you very much, Morag. Terry. Oh, my pleasure. And I'll make sure all of that information is in the show notes. And of course, you can add this video to your yes. movie credits on YouTube <laughs> once it goes live. So thank you again, thank Terry. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining Morag today. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe so you don't miss a thing. If you learned something worth sharing, share it. Cultivate your relationships today when you don't need anything before you need something. Be sure to follow Sky Team and Morag on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And if you have any ideas about topics we should tackle, interviews we should do, or if you yourself would like to be on the show, drop us a line at info at skyteam.com. That's S-K-Y-E team.com. Thanks again for joining us today. And remember, business is personal and relationships matter. We are your allies.